So I've built and released two side projects now that used GraphQL. In this video, I kind of wanted to reflect on what things I thought went well with them and what things I thought didn't go so well in regards to choosing GraphQL. So in this video, it's kind of going to be a GraphQL versus REST where I talk about the advantages that I felt were really nice when using it and some of the disadvantages of it. So hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a good idea if you're starting a new project, whether you should choose GraphQL or REST for it. So this, this video is going to be kind of from the point of view of someone who is a solo developer or working in a small team and some of the things you could get from that. Um, so I wasn't doing microservices or uh, a GraphQL gateway or any of that. It was just a single GraphQL server that I built out for this and I was the solo developer so I was both doing the front end and back end and full stack. So that was kind of just the background of my experience with this. So let's go ahead and jump into what I thought were some advantages of GraphQL from using it. So the first one, this is one everyone is going to talk about when they talk about GraphQL. And that's, there is no over underfetching um, of data with GraphQL. So basically you can specify the fields that you want um, and get exactly those back, which is very handy when you have multiple clients and different, not even multiple clients, um, but different pages that need different requirements of data. So just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, um, this is one query that I have in my uh, recipe project where we have cookbooks and sometimes all I care about is the name of the cookbook and so I will just request um, the name and I can do that like this and so I have some queries that look like that other times I need to know who the author of the cookbook is um, and whether that cookbook was shared with other people and so I have this field called shared info where I can get the first name and the last name of the person who shared the author anyway so this particular field requires me to do a join in the database or requires an extra computation to get. So when I don't when I don't need this information, not have not showing it, not requesting it is uh, efficient. So because of how GraphQL works, you can be efficient and only do the computations you need. But with that said, it's more complex to actually set this up on the back end side, which I'm going to get into when we get into the disadvantages. Um, but that's just one thing to note is uh, that. All right, so the next thing is pretty handy, and that's you don't have to version your GraphQL API. So basically, you have a GraphQL schema, and if you've used a REST API before, you may have seen it looks something like this, where there's versions. You may have v1 of the posts or v2 of the posts you're requesting. For example, GitHub, I think, is on v4 of the API. Uh, because, and the reason why you have to do this is when you release a new version of your API, not all the clients get the update right away. Same thing worked for me. When I released my app on the App Store, not everyone gets the same code on their phone right away. It takes some time to roll out the update. So there's going to be some people on the old version, some people on the new version, and your server needs to support both of those users. So with GraphQL, you can definitely still mess this up. Um, with your schema but if you're careful and know what you're doing and you just add fields um, to your schema uh, then both users that have old phones or the old version and new versions of stuff can still request stuff from your API uh, and they just use different fields so for example if we add a new field on this cookbook um, called uh, new author field oh, this was there you go new auth field I could select this on my new clients and that works fine and it doesn't affect my old clients uh, or old code because they don't need that field or whatever um, so that's one advantage there that has been quite handy because I don't have to think about that when I'm releasing new versions of my server I know if I'm just adding fields on it's not going to break any of the uh, old code when I upgrade alright so the last advantage is just because it's a type system and it's checking the types of everything um, and it knows the types of everything, there's some fun ex uh, fun benefits that you get from that. So the first one uh, is it just catches errors that you make. So for example, in my code, when I'm making requests to different APIs or different queries or mutations, and I forget to pass in a variable or something, it's going to tell me right away, and that saves some time. 
that's a small thing, but uh, it's pretty nice. The other thing is it's self-documenting. So even for myself, if I'm just the only developer, it's kind of nice to be able to go through um, the GraphQL schema and the GraphQL documentation that gets created um, for you to see uh, just a query it or I may have not touched a query in a while or a mutation or done something in a while and I can just go back and view what the stuff uh, that I can what variables I need to pass in and what I get back from that. So it's pretty handy even if I'm the only one working on it. And if you're working with a few other developers, it's super nice to be able to share uh, what information and how they can access the different endpoints. Um, and then the last one is the tooling that you get from this. So I this is probably, I would say, the biggest thing that uh, I've enjoyed about using GraphQL is the tools that are now available because it is... Uh, a type safe schema or it's a typed schema that you're creating. So I'm very happy with uh, the code generated on the front end. So using a combination of GraphQL code generator and Apollo, I'm able to just write a query like this and then it is going to generate a React hook for me now. And so it makes it very easy for me to write out my components very quick. So this is what one of those hooks looks like. This is a use my recipes query. Um, and it's very handy to integrate this with TypeScript. And so I get type definitions um, that change as my server changes automatically. And this is all generated from the server. So now what I can do is I can type variables, for example, and I can see exactly what I need to pass in here. So I need to pass something called options. Inside of options, I have two different fields I can pass in, a cursor and something called not in a cookbook, which is a Boolean, and cursor is a string or null or undefined. Um, and so I know exactly what I can pass in here uh, as values, and I can get very productive with that. And also just Apollo, uh, all the tooling that comes along with that, that's built on automatically for you. They're handling caching for you. Uh, you can easily refetch data. Um, you can easily go in and start pulling the data if you need to. I don't tend to do that too often, um, but just the information that they automatically give for you is super nice. Um, and so if I was building something with a REST API, I think I would want to find a tool similar to what Apollo does, or at least build out my own version that's similar to get some of this functionality, because I've been very happy with it um, and very productive using it. Um, all right, so that is pretty much the advantages that I noticed when using GraphQL, and I definitely would say the biggest one was the tooling and just the speed I was able to go uh, once I generate the query. And again, I'm able to put whatever fields I need for my uh, component, and then I generate the hook using GraphQL code generator, and then I go and use the Apollo component that's generated for me. All right, so now let's get into the disadvantages. So the first thing is um, it's kind of more complex to fetch and get everything working efficiently in GraphQL. So I talked about earlier about how we have this shared info field and sometimes I want the first name and the last name and sometimes I don't. Um, so what that means is in my code when I resolve and make this work it's a little bit more complex to do that and to do it in a way that's efficient in the back end and I'm not just hitting my database with a ton of requests. And so there's tools to help you out with this. You may have to use something like Data Loader uh, to get this working efficiently. Um, and there are some tools that are out there to help combat this, but it's something you have to note and you have to spend some more time with it. So you can use something like Prisma, Hasura, PostgreSQL, AppSync, and there's probably other ones as well. Um, they kind of try to help you out with making this process easier. And a lot of this has to do with when you're fetching relationships in the database and getting that data in there. All right, so next thing is it's harder to cache and rate limit stuff. So this is something where I didn't feel this one as much. I didn't feel like it was as hard to cache things. Um, another thing to note, if you're just working on a side project, you may not even have to deal with either of these two things at first. So that's something to note as well. Um, but when a lot of people bring up this point, um, caching they have they're talking about if you're caching using something like a CDN um, and I think a lot of times you're gonna end up caching using something like Redis anyway and so caching is a, not a whole lot different with GraphQL than with a REST API if you're using uh, Redis or something like that and so 
I wouldn't say it's that much harder to cache in GraphQL um, than it is in a REST API. Uh, but what I will say rate limiting is harder. There's also other problems where now people can do arbitrary queries and they can arbitrary query any number of fields and any number of times. And so you kind of need to have a system in place to handle that and to uh, what happens when someone requests too many fields. How do you know if they've requested too many fields? It's kind of uh, there's some tools in place that you can use to handle some of this stuff. But because you're letting the user choose or the client choose um, what fields are being requested, it can you don't know ahead of time. And so it is arbitrary and unknown. And so sometimes that can run into more complex scenarios with rate limiting. So that for sure comes up. The other thing is it's harder to monitor. So there's a lot of monitoring solutions for uh, REST APIs. And with GraphQL, there's only one endpoint. You always hit the slash GraphQL endpoint for all your requests. And so splitting things up by, all right, this resolver took this long to... Uh, request the data, this um, query took this long. And also, because of the nesting in GraphQL, there's this resolver, then there's this resolver, and this has a resolver. Everything has a resolver and it's all nested. So it's more complex to monitor the performance of it. You can use Apollo Engine, um, and I did try that for a little bit, but if you don't want to use Apollo Engine and send your data to Apollo, there's not a lot of other great options or open source options. Apollo tracing I tried out as well as another one, um, but I found like it just killed performance um, because it was basically tracing every single field. And if your data was getting, if you returned a lot of data from a resolver, Apollo tracing just slowed things down too much. But that's just kind of a side note if you know some of the tools in GraphQL. Uh, didn't really work out when I tried monitoring it, so I ended up doing kind of like my own little solution for that. Um, that's something you'll notice with GraphQL is not all the best practices I would say are out yet and they're still being established. So it's definitely something where you're gonna have to explore some of this stuff on your own and kind of figure it out. Then the last thing I would say is there's not really a Ruby on Rails or a Django quite yet where basically it is a full framework where it is helping you out and helping you be uh, building all these things out. These tools are trying to get closer to it they're not quite there yet, um, but there's just not this level of uh, these, if you're familiar with these web frameworks and the stuff they would handle for you, there's just not this level of helping out yet. Um, so I would say those are the things that I felt as disadvantages when I was using GraphQL. And I think it may be possible to build out some of this tooling for when you're using REST uh, APIs. And maybe this tooling already exists and I don't know about it, um, but I kind of want to use like a Apollo version for REST APIs. I think they may even have one if I remember. Um, but yeah, those are kind of the things that I thought were great about GraphQL and not so great about GraphQL. So in general, I would say I felt like GraphQL helped me out a lot on the front end, be productive on the front end, but also took more time to do some of the stuff on the back end. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're not as proficient in the back end, either consider using one of these tools to help you out, um, or maybe consider not using GraphQL. Um, but as a front end developer, the experience using GraphQL is very nice. And so I like that a lot. So if possible, I think it's really nice to use GraphQL for, the, for your front end developers. Um, they will really enjoy it. But there you go, that is the pros and cons of GraphQL versus REST.